Hello everyone, welcome back to Bell's Books. I'm Carly and today I am bringing you a much overdue wrap up. So I'm going to do um, three wrap ups because I'm way behind. I don't think I've spoken to you about what I've read since September. And I was doing um, some readathon, so I started to do Victober. That didn't really go as planned. <laughs> and I still haven't finished one of those books. Um, I did nonfiction November, which I will talk about in a separate wrap up. And then in December, I just tried to uh, finish as many of the books that I started this year as I could. And I did a little bit of that. So today I'm going to talk to you about four books that I, um, that I read in October, November time. And what should we start with? Okay, we'll start with, um, I don't have it a physical copy because it was an audio book, so I'll insert a picture here. Um, a Skinful of Shadows by Frances Hardinge. This is a um, is it like middle grade or YA um, book, and it is historical fiction, and um, it mixes a bit of supernatural and kind of fantasy in with it. Now, I've read um, The Lie Tree by Frances Hardinge before, and I really enjoyed that. Um, I think she just generally writes historical fiction, and um, and I really loved A Skinful of Shadows as well. So we follow our protagonist, Make Peace, who is um, lives with her mother and is brought up um, a Puritan. And she has a special ability to take ghosts or the spirits of uh, dead people into her brain and like keep them there. So at the beginning of the book, um, she finds this out because her mother is trying to train her on how to deal with it. And um, she ends up living with her father's family, who are this aristocratic um, family that do strange things with this with this odd ability. Uh, Make Peace is a really great character. I really loved her. Um, and I think that Frances Hardin writes really great young women characters. They're all sort of coming of age and finding their feet and finding their individuality. Um, and because they're historical fictions, it's always the history part is really um, fascinating. So I don't I, mean, I did history at school, but I don't know much about the English Civil War. Um, and so I found that quite fascinating. She was talking about the two factions and um, the way that make this aristocratic family were involved in that. Um, and the thing that I really enjoyed, I didn't actually write a book review on this. Usually when I finish uh, a book, I, I, I write down my thoughts on it. And this year that kind of went a bit to pop. Um, and I, when I was reading this, I did remember thinking, I like the commentary here that she's talking about um, in terms of like aristocratic families, but in a more wider sense, the way that relates to privilege and entitlement. Um, and I just thought it was particularly pertinent reading it last year when we were uh, thinking about like Black Lives Matter and that kind of stuff. And it was it just felt like it, for a historical fiction set in, you know, the 17th century, <laughs> it just felt um, kind of really relevant. And it was just a great story. The supernatural element was um, kind of spooky and really fascinating. I love that part. And it's a bit of an adventure because we're following make pieces. Uh, the the plot kind of ramps up and she realizes something is a, is amiss with this family that she's that she's come to live with um and it's just a lovely lovely book would highly recommend it and i would like to read more by her um i'm not i'm not overly sure what the other what her other books are but um i'm going to look out for more and it's just nice kind of easy to read when you're reading like middle grade ya um and i kind of need that at the moment so that was excellent. Okay, moving on. Then I read, I don't know what order I read these in. I can't remember. Um, Summer by Ali Smith. Sorry, the light in here is a bit mad. Um, this is the final book in the seasonal quartet by Ali Smith. I did have quite an emotional reading experience when I finished this because these books have been my life uh, since they first came out and I'm, I'm writing my PhD on them. So... Uh, as with Ali Smith, I always find it really difficult to summarise the books because they're not about plot. They're about, uh, these seasonal books are about the now, what's happening now, contemporary times. So there's always characters. And while previously I've said they are standalone books, they don't follow on from each other. This final book is the one where we come back to characters that we've met in 
previous novels. So we've got um, Daniel and Elizabeth come back in here from autumn and Art and Charlotte come back in here from winter. Um, it kind of ties things up. Not that there was much to tie up, but it's just... I really like what she does with this. So there's a we're following a family. The plot follow the, the loose plot follows a new family, the Greenlaws, and we have Sasha and Robert. Sasha is a young girl who is very worried about climate change, and she kind of represents uh, the the left liberals among us of the UK. And then Robert, her little shit house of a brother, <laughs> is the opposite. He's not very nice, um, and it's kind of interactions between them and then we look back so there's kind of flashbacks to Daniel's memories again which I really enjoyed because Daniel's character from Autumn was like probably my favourite out of this series so I really enjoyed going back to his story there's um, discussions about um, detainment in here because obviously detainment refugees and the way that the UK has treated um, people seeking asylum and refugees is a big theme in these books so when we look back at Daniel's journey we learn that he was also interred um, as an alien because he is German and um, so during a time when anyone that wasn't British born was suspicious um, I didn't know this I didn't know this either they just rounded up a load of people that were different nationalities and kept them in odd places like where was it it was like in holiday camps they just put them in these uh, like Butlins or something, uh, Isle of Wight and weird places and just kept moving them around. So they were like effectively in prison um, for doing nothing. Um, so that was fascinating because I always learn something new when I read Ali Smith, but it's always just like, oh, I didn't know that. Did that happen? Yeah, it did. Um, and as with Ali Smith, there are many layers in this book. It's not just about the green laws and Daniel and Elizabeth. There's lots going on. There's lots of themes. Uh, particularly the one that I'm writing about at the moment for my current chapter on my PhD is, is time. Uh, so she does a lot with time in here. We The narrative flicks back and forward between different times um, and different characters. And it's just so clever. It's just so clever. She's also picking up um, on intertextuality. So there's lots of mentions of Dickens and uh, Shakespeare, as always. There's always. She's always riffing off of a Dickens and a Shakespeare story. Um, there's some marvellous quotes at the beginning uh, of the book which again are picked up in themes uh, throughout the text so we've got the start of this um, novel uh, starts with everybody said so or everybody said so <laughs> which is uh, the beginning of The Haunted Man by Charles Dickens um, and it, it's also riffing off uh, The Winter's Tale by Shakespeare it's just if you haven't read these just go read them they're just fantastic and they're so easy to read um I'm going to talk about these separately I keep saying that and I haven't filmed them yet but I am going to talk about these separately because there's just so much to go into with, the, with these books I just love it it's easy to read please pick it up if you haven't it's marvellous she just does so much and considering how bleak everything is at the moment when this was published last year and how bleak everything is now like 2021's being like what's that hold my beer everything's got worse um Ali Smith has a way of of I don't know just filling you with hope making you feel like yeah this is all shit but we can do this people we can pull together there is always hope and there is hope in the in the greenness of the seasons and the oncoming spring and summer which we're hopefully looking forward to now in the depths of January all right, let's leave that because I've got too much to say about that. Okay, then I read, let's talk about this one, for my book club, um, The Girl with a Louding Voice by Abby Dare. Um, this was my book club choice. I always read my book club choice and I did enjoy this book. I think I gave it a three or four stars, I can't remember. It's quite tough going. It covers some difficult content. So this is the story of Aduni. She is a 14 year old girl who is sold effectively by her father um, for her bride price to a very old man as his bride, um, which is kind of, you know, not very nice to read. And then she has to leave her family home and her, her brother, her little brother who she adores 
um, and go and live as this man's wife, which th there's obviously some kind of traumatic things that go on as part of that. So trigger warning there uh, for rape. And um, it's written in the first person from her perspective and it's written in her broken English, which is was a really a kind of interesting way um, I, I did like it and as the narrative goes on her drive her motivation is that she wants an education she doesn't want to get married to this dude um even though it's culturally acceptable in her village uh, where she's from like she said most other girls want to get married and they think i've done well because my husband is well off or whatever um but she just wants to learn and she just wants an education and uh so she does whatever she can to get to that point um there's some odd tragedy that happens, which means that she then gets taken in as a domestic servant to this um, very, very rich family in Lagos. And um, the thing that I thought was, was very good was the way that she looked at extremes of like poverty and wealth. So where Adoni's from in her village, um, it's very basic. You know, they don't, they have they have very basic amenities but she's when she's young and she's in like playing with her friends in the river she's happy that's all she needs um because she's safe and she's got her friends and her family and then when she goes to live in this massive house in lagos she's treated not very nice um by her boss who kind of physically abuses her she's also subjected to um the threat of rape by her boss's husband so it's quite dark stuff in this book um and she's trying to find out what happened to her predecessor so the previous maid disappeared and she's she's worried she's like what happened to her so she's this is like her investigating what happened to rebecca um the uh the previous maid and it's just it's it's a page turner it really kept me intrigued um, and you notice as she goes on and she starts to learn English, because in this big house she's in, she starts reading the dictionary, which is really cute. So she'll read the dictionary and learn certain words. And she reads, I think it's like the Nigeria Book of Facts. And at, on some of the chapter headings, um, yeah, there's like there's like a fact at each heading. The fact that she's reading from that um, from that book. Um, so like this one. Many Nigerians have superstitious beliefs about pregnancy. One of such is the belief that attaching a safety pin to a pregnant woman's clothing will ward off evil spirits. Um, and then she kind of, from that fact, she's talking about something that's happening um, in, in as part of her narrative. So I really enjoyed that. And then by the end, I won't give any spoilers, but you can, the, the tone of the narrative has changed so that you notice that the way she's speaking has improved because her English has improved. And that was really lovely. Um, and yeah, so kind of a little bit of a traumatic read, but very good. Would highly recommend this. Really enjoyed it. Okay, and lastly, I have a poetry collection to talk to you about. I've talked about this before, I think, because I read this over a long period of time. This is Magnolia. Those characters there, the Chinese characters, I didn't know this when I first picked it up, mean Mulan, um, which in Chinese is the same word as Magnolia. Um, this is by Nina Mingya Powell's. She is new, from New Zealand, living in London. And this book, I, I adored this collection, even though I read it over a long period of time. I like to, sometimes I like to take my time with poetry and just digest it a little bit. Good word, because this book has a lot of food writing and I adored that. I know she's written a book, a food memoir, I think, called Tiny Moons, which I want to get my hands on. Because that was, I think, the favourite thing about this collection was the food writing is just sublime i just love it so there's <laughs> there's lots of writing about food in in shanghai and she's i'm gonna link in the description box below a little video that where she speaks about this collection because it's just fascinating and she reads one of the poems now again another very accessible poetry collection for people who are afraid of poetry so this is very easy to read um it as the title suggests, Mulan talks about women from myth and pop culture and legend, which is fascinating. So some of them I didn't know, like there's some names in here that I'm like, I don't know who that is. That kind of goes over my head. Um, but Mulan, a lot of us are familiar with the Disney film. Um, there's a poem in, in that 
in here about that um there's like a poem about blade runner and other women from legend and myth and it's just i like the way that it crosses landscapes because she's because of all the different places she's lived so new zealand and she lived in shanghai and london it's there's a lot of kind of contrast here and also contrast between different languages um and i find you one of my favorite poems which i don't know if i turn the page down on probably not so there's some uh, uh poems in here that have like chinese characters in um and i've spoken about this in uh what was it flesh by mary jean chan i really enjoyed that collection as well um i like when people when poets talk about things that i don't know that i'm learning so um this poem is about chinese characters let me just read you this because it's marvelous I read an article about a boy in China whose name contained such a rare ancient character, half dragon, half sky, that it no longer existed anywhere except when written down by hand, the computer could not print his name. I just, that's, do you know what I mean? I just love that. I think it's just lovely. It's just beautiful. And what certain Chinese characters mean and how they, you can't translate them, but, but I don't know. It's just, oh, it's just lovely just read it also really like what she does with form in here so we've got some poems where they're kind of half and half on different pages so um this one you could kind of read it along here or you can read it in different columns so there's a few of those and i just i just love this collection <laughs> please pick it up it is marvelous okay this video is already too long those are the four books I wanted to talk to you about. I will be back with my non-fiction November wrap-up, my December wrap-up where I try to finish some books. And I want to talk to you about my, my favourite books of 2020. And I want to talk to you about uh, my reading goals for next year and things that I'm going to be doing on the channel coming up. So lots of exciting stuff to tell you about. And hopefully it won't be so long uh, between videos. I'm just having a rough time of it at the moment as... Um, as everybody is but there's a member of my very close family that has covid and i'm having trouble dealing with that at the moment so everything's a bit shit but i'll carry on talking about books because that makes things a little better i hope you're all okay talk to me in the comments below tell me what you're reading tell me all the things and i'll speak to you soon bye guys